Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the mailbag uh, all viewer question episode done over here at AMC Movie News. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor in chief of AMC Movie News, and I'm so glad that you decided to uh, join me on this Saturday. It's, as the title of the show suggests, uh, instead of running down movie news like we do Monday through Friday on AMC Movie Talk, on this episode, all we do is just take your mailbag questions. And I've got, I think, like eight mailbag questions pulled out. So let's not waste any time. Let's jump right into it with question number one. And the first question today comes to us from Corey Leach, who writes, I just watched 12 Years a Slave, and while it was beautifully shot and an acted film, I also read Mr. Northrop's uh, autobiography, and there were a lot of liberties taken with the source material. When making a film about a biography, especially when the source material is so moving and controversial, should the film honor the writings uh, so as to play up the characters in an honest portrayal? Um, well, Corey, I mean, I I've said this before um, about films based on real stories and, and true events. It is not the job, uh, and I'm sure you've heard me say this before, I don't believe it's the job of the filmmakers to be history professors. Um, motion pictures, movies, unless they're documentaries, uh, movies aren't meant to be educational tools. Movies are created for entertainment. And as such, the, the filmmaker's number one priority is to make an entertaining, compelling um, film that hopefully makes the audience, uh, you know, think, experience, and feel. And that's their primary job. And in doing so, quite often, they will take some liberties. And, and I've never minded that because, like I said, I don't believe sitting in a movie theater on a Saturday afternoon is a replacement for a history book. Uh, and anybody who does needs to have their head examined. So I'm okay with them taking liberties. Now, I will draw the line. I wouldn't say that, you know... All bets are off. Like, if you're a silly spoof thing like Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, that's fine. If you're going if you're going completely ridiculous like that, that's fine. Take lots of liberties. Um, but I would prefer if, you know, stories based on true events don't go way off the reservation. Like, don't take so many liberties that you're completely changing what actually happened. So, like, for instance, if you're doing Argo... Um, with Ben Affleck, which was a magnificent film. But if you're doing Argo with Ben Affleck, don't uh, say that Ben Affleck strapped on a bunch of M16s and went running in you know, to, to, the, to the foreign ministry office and shot up a thousand bad guys and rescued the, um, the American diplomats who were being held. Like, don't, don't com go completely off the reservation, uh, but by all means, take some liberties. And I think it's okay that they do that. I really do. If, if nothing else... It's kind of like remakes, right? I believe if you make a really good um, movie based on a true event, it can get people interested in actually learning more about the real thing. So like a remake, let, let's say The Departed. Um, I know so many people who had never even heard of Infernal Affairs, my all-time favorite cop film. People never even heard of Infernal Affairs, let alone see it that went out and got Infernal Affairs and watched it because of The Departed, which is the North American remake of Infernal Affairs. And I think the same can be said of, of movies based on true event. I think if you do a movie that's really good and people enjoy it, I think it, it can increase a lot of interest in people to go out and learn more about that topic. So I'm going to go out on a limb here, um, and I'm going to guess, like just off the top of my head, Corey, that you you mentioned that you read Northrop's book. I bet you hadn't thought about reading it if that movie had never come out. So instantly we already see a benefit, right? That because of 12 Years a Slave is out there, yeah, maybe it takes a few liberties, but it got you interested in the real story and you went out and read the book and I think that's a good thing. So uh, do I think that they need to honor the source material and stay absolutely true to it? No, I believe they should should be able to take liberties. Um, when they where where and when they can, but you know, don't go too far and take you know grand liberties to the point that you're actually changing the story. Just my opinion, uh, and you know, you guys may have a completely different opinion, and that's cool. Leave your thoughts in the comments section below. All right, moving on to question number two today, and question number two comes to us from Austin Najer, who writes. 
Hey, MC Movie News, love the show. I grew up in the 1990s and therefore loved Space Jam growing up with Michael Jordan, of course. Um, I saw news that Warner Brothers had hired a producer slash screenwriter for a sequel that was supposed to star LeBron James. Sources near LeBron are saying, however, that he won't be in the film. Any idea what basketball player might be in Space Jam, Space Jam 2 if not LeBron? Thanks and bring on the filthy. Well, for those of you who don't know uh, what Austin is talking about, yesterday news started flying all over the place that um, Space Jam 2 was coming. And of course, you know, the original hybrid animated live action with Michael Jordan um, was made back in the 90s. And this news started flying around that they were doing Space Jam 2 and it was going to, this one was going to star LeBron James. Now, actually, there have been whispers about LeBron James, to be honest, doing a Space Jam 2 for a long time. Like, th these types of... This has been around for like two or three years, these whispers. And so this news came out, or these reports came out yesterday, that it was happening, it was done, it was happening. Well... Uh, now ESPN and a bunch of other sources are saying LeBron James and his his group are saying this is news to us. Nope, this isn't happening. You know, uh, now that's not to say it won't ever happen, and it's not to say that LeBron James and his people aren't lying about it. But like I said, the new report is that LeBron James and his people are saying we've never heard of this. So no, this isn't happening. Um, so if they were doing Space Jam two, so let's go on the assumption for a second that Space Jam two is going to happen. And it's not going to star LeBron James. Both of those are two pretty big assumptions. But let's assume that for a second. That they're going to make a Space Jam 2. Well, it would make sense that you would have LeBron James in it. I mean, when the first Space Jam came out, they went out and got the undisputed best basketball player on the planet. And that was Michael Jordan at the time. And, and, and probably the best basketball player of all time. But he was definitely the best basketball player of his age. And so they went and got Michael Jordan. It would just make sense that if you're going to do a Space Jam 2, look, the undisputed best basketball player on the planet is LeBron James. He's a four-time MVP. Um, it's just, it makes sense. You should get LeBron James. If not LeBron James, honestly, there's nobody I can think of. Maybe a Kevin Durant. Um, maybe Kevin Durant would be an okay substitute because he's got a real family-friendly face. Um, but it, it seems to me that if you're not going to get the undisputed best basketball player on the planet, which is LeBron James, then what's then do you do a Space Jam 2? Maybe if it's Kevin Durant, but outside of Kevin Durant, I couldn't see anybody else. I really couldn't. So there you go. Let's move on to question number three today. And question number three today comes to us from Sal Donato, who writes... Greetings, AMC Movie Talk crew. I hope all is well. Well, thank you, Sal. It is all well today, actually. If a character does die in Avengers Age of Ultron, do you think it could possibly be Pepper Potts? I know we don't know for sure if Pepper will be in the movie, but being that all signs uh, are all sort of pointing towards Tony creating Ultron, and the fact that Joss Whedon likes to kill his characters, in this case a character that wouldn't have a standalone franchise anyway, which is sort of a plus for Marvel slash Disney, do you think it would really salt the wound if Ultron killed Pepper in the process? Um, that's, that's a good question, Sal. Well, first of all, let's say this. A lot of people, and I might be guilty of this myself, actually, now that I think about it, but a lot of people are, are running around saying, wow, that Joss Whedon loves to kill characters in his shows and everything like that. I, not really. I mean, does Joss Whedon kill more characters in his properties than other movie makers kill in their properties? I, I'm not so sure that they do. Joss Whedon certainly doesn't mind killing off characters in his properties. That's clear. But does he do it so often that it's exceptional and that he loves killing off his own characters? I don't think he does. I mean, look at Christopher Nolan. Lots of characters in his movies die. But nobody runs around and says, Christopher Nolan loves killing off his characters. And I think the same is true of Joss Whedon. I think Joss definitely doesn't mind sacrificing his characters if he thinks it's good for the story. But I, I, I don't see him doing it so often that he's just like gun happy to go out and kill his own people. Um, so let's get that out of the way. But your theory sounds really good. Now, I don't actually know. I'd have to look it up. But I don't know for sure that uh, the Pepper Potts is even in the next Avengers movie. I'm going to go ahead and out on a limb and assume that she does appear in it. But 
If they do what I suspect they're doing and that, that Tony creates Ultron, you're right. It is salt in the wound if Tony's own creation doesn't just go mad and become a threat to the world, but he also kills Pepper. That's a huge story arc right there. That, that's a really nice story hook that I think would get viewers um, emotionally hooked into Tony's plight even more. And I think we become even more emotionally attached to Tony and the other members of the Avengers for that matter uh, if a character like Pepper were to die at the hands of Ultron. I think that's a super slick idea. I don't know that that's what they're going to do. Um, I actually have my doubts that that's what they're going to do. But I love your theory um, because I think it would really serve the story. It kills off a character that you're right does, isn't going to have, we're not about to see Pepper Potts the movie anyway. Um, but you know, here's the interesting thing about Pepper Potts. And when I was, I was talking with um, uh, uh, Gwen Paltrow um, once about Iron Man and stuff like that. And what I told her was absolutely true. I said this, you know, most of us geek nerds, we don't like romantic love interests in our superhero movies. Generally speaking, we don't. Uh, we would much rather see more Spider-Man screen time spent to fighting Dr. Octopus than ooing and aahing over, you know, his love interest in the film. We'd rather see Wolverine hacking and slashing stuff up than time wasted on his love interest stuff. I, the, the, the sweaty film nerds that we are, we don't, we're not really into the love story stuff in a lot of these superhero movies. Except for me, I gotta say, I've always loved the relationship between uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and Robert Downey Jr. They have done a terrific job orchestrating, I think, a fun, funny, um, witty, kind of hyper exchange relationship between Tony and Pepper. I think that's a great, it's the only one I really, really like in superhero movies. So I would be a little sad to see her go, but if they did it the way you were kind of explaining it, Sal, I'm all for it. It's because it sounds like a really good story hook, but that's just my opinion. All right, question number four today. We're flying through these pretty fast, actually. Question number four today comes to us from Roning60, who writes, Greetings, fellow AMC movie buffs. I have a question about the new casting of the Fantastic Four babies. Since Michael B. Jordan is playing Human Torch, who would your pick be if they did choose to go with an African-American female as the Invisible Woman? Well, for those of you who may not know what Roning is talking about, um, the the official cast came out about who our new Fantastic Four is, and it's uh, it's going to be Miles Teller as uh, Mr. Fantastic. It's going to be Jamie Bell as the Thing. It's going to be Kate Mara as the Invisible Woman, and it's going to be Michael B. Jordan as the Human Torch. And um, I, the reason he said Muppet or uh, Fantastic Four babies is because when I first saw the, the the rumor of this cast about two months ago. I said, it's like the Muppet Babies, only it's the Fantastic Four Babies. Because to me, Dr. Richards is supposed to be in his early 40s, gray hair streaks and stuff like that. And, and, and I kind of call them now affectionately the Fantastic Four Babies. Because, <coughs> pardon me, because they've gone so young. Now, some people like to chastise me on the internet and they've run, well, John, if you read the Ultimates version of Fantastic Four, you know they go kind of young. So they're just being honest to the source material. You, you're you just showing you're ignorant of the source material. No, I'm not ignorant of the source material. I understand that there are versions of the Fantastic Four comics where you have younger guys. But that's not the classic Fantastic Four. That's not the Fantastic Four the majority of people know and love. And that I know and love personally. So it's a personal thing. Um, but, you know, there's also an Earth-35 version of the Green Lantern named something else. And there's also a version of this in this comic book where a, a little mushroom becomes Superman. And there's a ver there's lots of versions for everything. Um, so when I call the Muppet Babies or the Fantastic Four, the new Fantastic Four Babies, and that's not me saying there's no comic out there anywhere that ever suggests that you have a younger version of the Fantastic Four. I'm not saying that at all. It's just that 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 version of the Fantastic Four is not one I particularly like. I would like the classic Fantastic Four. That's what I want. But that's just my personal preference. It doesn't mean that needs to be your personal preference. So when you hear me say Fantastic Four babies, that's what I mean. I'm kind of referring to that and making fun of the fact that they're going young. Um, but being as they're going young, this is a good cast. I mean, I wouldn't want them to go this young. I don't want a, a, an early to mid-20s, you know, Mr. Fantastic. But if that's the way you're going, then Miles Teller's a good guy to have in the role. If you're going to not, if you're going to have like a 24-year-old in the movie, like an early 20s Ben Grimm, 
Well, if you if you're gonna do that, Jamie Bell's a good actor, and I like him, so I'm all for that. Um, I like Kate Mara very much. I like Michael B. Jordan very much. Now, but let's get to the heart of the question that, that you were asking, which is about, um, I also brought up on AMC Movie Talk the other day that, I, look, Michael B. Jordan is a dynamite actor. I have no problem with them changing ethnicities for Johnny Storm because to me, whenever changing ethnicity, whether it's a black character to a white dude or a white character to a Chinese dude or what, whatever, the only question I ask is, does changing the ethnicity change anything else about the core elements about who that character is? So my argument has always been, if you try to take the Black Panther and everything we know about the Black Panther, where he's from, who he's descended from, you know, who his father is, all that kind of crap, and you change Black Panther into a white dude, well, the simple act of changing the character from black to white, that changes a lot about our understanding of the character. That changes a ton of things. Whereas with Johnny Storm, there's nothing white about Johnny Storm. I mean, all other things being equal, keep things the way they are, but but I have no problem with him changing him from white to black because changing Johnny Storm from white to black doesn't really change anything else about his character. Except this one thing I have a problem with. Sue Storm and Johnny Storm are natural birth siblings. And that's an important thing in the Fantastic Four universe. And I've always, what I've been saying is that I have no problem going with Michael B. Jordan as Johnny Storm. I just really wish that if you were going to make Johnny Storm Michael B. Jordan and make, make him black instead of white, I wish you would have followed through on that, Fox, and made Sue Storm an African-American actress. Like, because in keeping... In casting Kate Mara and Michael B. Jordan, you've destroyed the thing of natural birth siblings. You've you've kind of thrown that out the window. And that's a key essential element, I believe anyway, to me, is, is important. So, I mean, what I've always said was, even when the first rumor of Michael B. Jordan came up, I've always said, you know, hey, I have no problem if they make Johnny and Sue black. I have no problem to make Johnny and Sue white. I, I th that's fine with me. I don't. I don't really care. To me, it doesn't change the core elements of who they are. Just make sure they're they're natural birth siblings. Either make them both white or make them both black. So <clears throat> the question, and I mentioned that on AMC uh, Movie Talk the other day. And so the question is, who would I then, if I were in charge of Fox, and we've already cast Michael B. Jordan, um, I've got four actresses in mind actually that that I would completely see. Now, there are lots of great um, African-American actresses out there right now, but these four, I think, not only are really talented, but I could see as a good fit. There are certainly more talented actresses than the four I'm about to mention, but I think these four are not only talented, I think they would be a good fit to be a, Sue St a black Sue Storm and an on-screen sibling for Michael B. Jordan. So um, the first one I'm going to bring up is uh, Katerina Graham. And most of you probably don't know who she is, but she's on that TV show, The Vampire Diaries. And yes, full disclosure, I've watched a couple seasons of The Vampire Diaries with my wife. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't in the last year or so, but I have watched a few seasons of The Vampire Diaries. And I got to tell you, the, this girl impressed me. Not only is she knockout beautiful and absolutely stunning, the screen camera loves Miss Graham. She's just beautiful. But... She's played a witch on screen, which is kind of like the superhero, supernatural zone. She's played that in. She's played very well. I thought she's always been very good on screen. I think she has some really good characteristics to be a good Sue Storm and, once again, play off as a sibling of Michael B. Jordan. So that would be my number four. My number three uh, would be uh, Gabriel Union, who we've seen in films like, uh, well, we've seen her on TV like West Wing. We've seen her in Bad Boys too. I thought she was really funny in Think Like a Man. I always said like Think Like a Man was like a 2012 or 2013, I can't remember which year it came out, was one of those really cool little surprise hits to me. And I thought Miss Union was amazing. And I thought she was really solid. Once again, she's she's got a bit of a humor side to her, some snark to her. I think she'd be a really good Sue Storm. Once again, playing off, uh, playing really well off of Michael B. Jordan. Um, my number two pick for a Black Sue Storm it is a little bit of a cop out, but it's Kerry Washington. Now I know it feels like a cop out because Kerry Washington's really hot right now with her show Scandal, but she's always been good 
Like in everything she does, she's solid and she's amazing. She was really good in Django Unchained. She's really good in everything she's done. But a lot of people you may remember, Carrie already has a Fantastic Four connection in that she played a very minor role in the first two Fantastic Four films. Remember, she was Ben Grimm's girlfriend. Now, I'm usually completely, you know, some might say, hey, John, you're being a little hypocritical here because you always say, if you're remaking something, don't bring over old cast members. You're right. I do say that all the time. I have always said I'd make an exception for J. Jonah Jameson uh, with the Spider-Man thing. But I, I think I would make a little bit of an exception here for Kerry Washington, too. Number one, because she is such a great actress. She's got great name, rec uh, uh, great name recognition. She's beautiful. She's terrific on screen, and I, and I think she'd play well off the thing, and I think the fact that she's got a little bit of a connection to the story already, I think that makes her a nice candidate. So she would be my number two pick for uh, actresses playing a Black Sue Storm. My number one pick, though, may surprise uh, some of you, but my number one pick is going to be, I, I, I hope I'm not mispronouncing her name because I've only ever read her name. I've read it a million times, but Nicole Berry. Um, who was in movies like Shame. She was really good in 42 as Jackie Robinson's wife. Uh, but most notably for me, she also stars in that TV show right now, um, um, Sleepy Hollow, which I, I love. It's one of my favorite new shows of the year. Actually, Sleepy Hollow probably is my favorite new show of this, this year that we've just had. Uh, and she's wonderful in it. I am a, she turned me into a big fan. She was my favorite part, actually, besides Harrison Ford in 42. I thought her performance was terrific, even though it wasn't a huge role. But she is magnificent in Sleepy Hollow. I really love her. And I think she would have a great on-screen chemistry with Michael B. Jordan as siblings. So, so there you go. Those are four actresses I would have picked. Um, to be a Black Sioux Storm had they done what I wish they'd done and, and kept them blood siblings. Uh, but obviously, they're going in a different direction, and let's just wait and see. I mean, I don't like the decision that they've made, but that doesn't mean it's not the right decision, and it doesn't mean it's not going to work out great. Let's, let's wait and see if it works out. I'm just not really happy with the decision, but I'm not completely against it either for, for all the reasons I've already said before. <coughs> all right, let's move on to question number five. And question number five comes to us today from Jason Thorne, who writes, I have just been, I've just seen the new RoboCop reboot and thought it was actually better than I anticipated. As you say, leave it all at the door and go in open-minded. My question is, do you think we will see a RoboCop 2 off of this reboot? Keep up the amazing work. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us expected the new RoboCop to suck. Uh, and it's okay to have two separate things you make up in your head. Number one is what is your anticipation? You base your anticipation on the things that you've seen, the things that you've heard, the things that you've read, and how that sits with you. So, you know, I made uh, an, a prediction that I think this RoboCop movie is, is probably going to be really bad. I think it's going to suck um, because I wasn't impressed with the trailers, wasn't really happy with a lot of the casting, um, wasn't, you know, it's just, and the feel and the direction, they, they changed them from silver to black, all this kind of stuff made me go, okay, my prediction, my anticipation is that this movie is going to suck. But you then, when you go to, I always say this, when you go to a movie, you have to take that impression you have of a movie before you've seen it. You have to take that prediction your mind has formulated in your head and you have to be willing to leave that prediction at the door when you go into the theater because once you walk into the theater and see the movie, now you have a second decision to make is did you like the movie or not? Forget everything about your prediction. Now you have to judge whether you thought the movie was good or not. You, you judged whether you thought it looked good or not. Now you have to judge whether it is good or not and there are two separate decisions. Um, lots of people say, oh, don't form an opinion until you see the movie. Well, that's dumb. If you didn't form an opinion, why would you go see a movie? Well, I went to go see it because it looked good. Well, there you go. You made a judgment call. You made a judgment that you thought it looked good. And so you went to go see it. So we all make a judgment before we see it. Just be willing to leave that judgment at the door when you go into the theater about what you thought it looked good or not. 
Now go into the theater and make another personal judgment on whether you think it is good or not. So those are two separate things. So I think a lot of us thought RoboCop, the remake, was going to suck. And I got to tell you, while I wasn't thrilled with the RoboCop remake, I thought it was okay. Which is a lot better than I thought it was going to be. And as a matter of fact, you know, you're not the only person I've heard mentioning this. A lot of people have been coming out of RoboCop and going, you know what? Not bad. I mean, most people agree it's not as good as the original, the classic. But a lot of people are coming out saying, that was kind of fun. That was a fun time at the movie theater. And what else can we ask from our movies? So being as a lot of people are coming out of RoboCop saying, you know what? That was, that was better than we thought it was going to be. That was not bad. A lot of people are feeling that way. So could there be a sequel? I doubt it um, because for two reasons. Number one, while the reactions people have been giving this film are a lot better than maybe we would have anticipated, they're still not great. I don't, pardon me, I don't see a lot of people jumping up and down um, really excited about this RoboCop. I, I don't see people going, oh my gosh, this is going to be, you know, easily in my top 10 favorite films of the year. You know, we don't see a lot of people going, oh my God, this is in my, this is one of my top favorite. This is better than the original. You know, there's not a lot of people going crazy about the film. So that's one thing. But the other thing is it's a hundred million dollar film. I think right now it's only made about 30, which means this movie is going to really, really struggle to even break even. And I don't think it's going to break even. I think this movie's going to lose money uh, at the pace it's going at right now. Uh, maybe if they get really lucky, they might get close to breaking even, but it's going to lose money. So you have a movie that loses money. There wasn't big response to it, either from critics or the fans, although it was better than we thought. Not a lot of people have been hyping about it. Those two things combined make me think that RoboCop 2 is probably off the table. I don't think we're going to see a, a new RoboCop 2. But, I mean, maybe we're wrong. Maybe they got a great idea and they believe in it and they say to hell with the money that we lost, which is a good way to get fired. But they say to hell with the money that we lost, let's make another one, and then maybe they'll do another one. Um, and I'll be there to see it. I, I think this RoboCop was good enough that if they came out with a RoboCop 2, I would have some anticipation to, to see it. I'd be a little bit excited to see it. So let's see how it all turns out. All right, the next question, question number six, comes to us today from Jose C., who writes, with the legendary, with Legendary's 2014 Godzilla due out in barely three months, why is there still barely any promotional material available for this movie? Have they written it off as a loss since it's going up against the likes of Spider-Man and the X-Men? Or are they preparing to announce it's being pushed back to a safer release date? Why does it feel like Legendary has been hiding its teasers and promotion material from us, the fans of this franchise, the ones who would happily spread good word of mouth if it be good? Well, Jose, I, I got to say I disagree with you on this. Um, we're still three months away from the release, maybe just a hair under three months. But that's three months away. They've already given us a full-length feature trailer. They re just released the brand new poster. I mean, th where is it written that a movie has to have eight trailers and 45, you know, behind-the-scenes production stills and 18 posters? Th that's not written anywhere. There are lots of movies coming out in three months that don't have any trailers out yet uh, or within three months of their release. And only released two or three trailers and, and stuff like that. Look, I didn't like the first Godzilla trailer. I think Godzilla is going to be an awesome movie. But I wasn't really thrilled with the first trailer. But a lot of people loved it and talked about it and buzzed about it. And <clears throat> um, I'll be honest with you. They've, they've already released a major trailer. They've released posters. We're still three months out. I, I got to disagree with you, Jose. I don't think they're behind the curve. Now... If you want to take a movie like X-Men Days of Future Past, that it feels like every other day, 44 new behind-the-scenes stills from Days of Future Past, 16 new character posters, we're on the cover of Total Film Magazine, another two-second clip of whatever. They, they, I, I gotta be honest with you. A couple of weeks ago, I got X-Men Days of Future Past out. I'm fatigued of X-Men Days of Future Past stuff, and I've, I've now just tuned it out. I mean, yeah, I talked about it a little bit when they released, the, um, you know, the, all the special covers and things like that. But it's because yeah, it was a new story. We, we talked about it. But there have been lots of days where new, uh, more new image. I swear, 
to heaven. There have been like 400 X-Men Days of Future Past images released. And I'm just, I'm tired of it. And I've just tuned it out. It's too much. Like I was fine after the second trailer. Now I was ready for the movie. Give me the movie now. Um, but there, there is such a thing as over-marketing it. And I, I kind of feel like at this point they're over-marketing X-Men Days of Future Past with all this little stuff that they keep releasing. It, it's too much. Look, if you're a fan looking forward to Godzilla, then you're already hyped about the trailer. The new poster they put out this uh, just a couple days ago was awesome. That Godzilla poster looks incredible. I love it. Um, and we're still three months away. So, no, I, I don't think there's anything to worry about at this point. You know, if we get to be four weeks away from the release and there's they haven't released anything new, like not a new poster, not a new version of a trailer... Then maybe worry, but I, I'm pretty sure in the next eight weeks, we're going to get some new TV spots, some whatever. They're just ramping it up. I don't see anything to worry about yet. All right. Next question comes to us from Nathaniel Evans, who writes, First of all, I have to say that I love the show. Well, thank you so much, Nathaniel. Uh, I stumbled upon it on YouTube two weeks ago, and I haven't missed a show since. Thanks so much, and keep it up. I have a couple of questions regarding Star Trek. With a new director heading up the next film, will it drastically change the feel of this rebooted series, other than less lens flare? Also, do you think the next will focus on a conflict with the Klingons? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Nathaniel, and for the kind words. Um, for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, J.J. Abrams, who directed the first two Star Trek, uh, the new Star Trek films that he did, he is not directing the next Star Trek film. He's not directing Star Trek Three. So he's basically asking, okay, with them getting a new director, will this drastically change the feel of the films? And I don't think so at all. I, I think, look, they've already established what the feel of this new Star Trek universe is. And I think when they get a new director in, that's going to be part of the understanding is that, okay, this is the feel of our universe. Obviously, with a new director, there's going to be a, a little bit of a different feel. He'll put his fingerprints, his or her fingerprints on the new film <coughs> that are uniquely their own. But as far as you use the word drastic, as far as there being a drastic change in the field, I really don't think so. Look at all the Harry Potter films. There were several directors that directed various Harry Potter films, and they were all kind of unique in their own way. But as a whole, that series felt cohesive. It didn't go drastically in a different direction. You know, Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi were all directed by three different directors. And yet they all... They all were very unique, but they, none of them were drastic departures. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> the same can be said about a lot of film franchises. So, no, I don't think we have to worry about a new director coming in and then being a drastic change of the feel of the film. I don't think so. It'll be unique. It'll be have their own fingerprint on it. Um, but I don't think we have to worry about a drastic departure. Now, as far as the second part of your question about could we see Klingons, I think it's time. I think it's time for the Klingons. I think it's time for a grander galactic scale uh, event. Um, and I, I think it was great that they used Khan for Star Trek II. He's probably one of the most beloved individual uh, villains, probably the most beloved individual villains in the Star Trek universe. But as far as when you think Star Trek, you think Klingons. It, it, the Klingons are synonymous with Star Trek. Um, and now they're getting into the third film. I think it's totally cool that they didn't make the Klingons the big enemy in the first one. I think it's totally cool they didn't make the Klingons the big enemy in the second one. But but now we're getting into the third film. And I think it's time. I think it's time for a galactic scale, Star Trek-like conflict with the Klingons. I think that's what fans want. I think it would be really cool to do. I think it would fit in well with this universe they've already set up. And it's the perfect timing with a new director coming in to give it their sort of unique touch. I would love it. I really would. I think it would be a really nice move for them to bring in the Klingons at this point. All right. The last question that we're going to address today comes to us from Victor Vera, who writes, Hi, AMC Movie Talk. I'm from Peru. Well, thank you for watching from there. And I love the show. Congratulations. Anyway, my question was, what movie do you think is going to win the Oscar for Best Animated Film? I think Frozen but I really want The Wind Rises to win. It's a very complete movie and is the last work of Miyazaki as a director. Uh, well, thanks a lot for the question, Victor. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know, The Wind Rises is reportedly the final film that Miyazaki is, uh, is going to direct. And, you know, Miyazaki has 
uh, he's kind of legendary, whether it's, you know, uh, Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle, Poign- I mean, the pr- pr- lots of them. I could list off like 15 films. The interesting thing about The Wind Rises, though, is that it is a very different film from anything Miyazaki's done before. Um, I mean, most of his of his well-known work is like very, very fantasy-based. And Wind Rises is really more of a uh, an era-placed period piece, a historical period piece. Uh, about a very, you know, um, influential and, and timely events in, in the in the life of the nation of Japan. I mean, it's a it's a very different film than what he's ever done, and I think a very brave choice for him to do that kind of a film. And a lot of people in Japan didn't like the fact that he made this film. As a matter of fact, for different reasons, you can read up why online. But uh, I thought it was a very bold choice for him to do as his final one because you you'd think Miyazaki is going to do his final film. You think it's going to be big, some grand fantasy animated spectacle, right? And and he didn't. And I thought that was really interesting. But I will also say this. I don't think The Wind Rises is his best work. And I wouldn't even put it in the top four of his films. Um, I think it's a good movie. I think it's a bold movie. I think it's an interesting movie. But is it the best animated film this year? I, I'm going to say no. Um I, and I'm going to say I think Frozen will win. And I think Frozen should win. I, I, I actually think Frozen is a better animated film than, than The Wind Rises. Um, only not... Not because Miyazaki doesn't deserve his Oscar. Miyazaki is legend. But is this his best work? Is this particular film that great? I, I don't think it's that great. I think it's a good movie. I don't think it's a great movie. Um... And I know some people will be really upset that I said that, but that's my you're asking my opinion, and, and that's my honest opinion. I will never lie to you about my opinion. And my opinion is I, I think it's a good movie. I don't think it's a great movie and doesn't deserve to win over Frozen this year. So uh, that's just kind of my two cents on that. Well, folks, um, that'll do it for me. I'm all done. I've run all out of questions. Thank you so much for joining me today. I will be back again tomorrow for another for the Sunday installment of AMC Mailbag. If uh, I'm, you'll be able to tell if Canada won or lost the gold medal hockey game tomorrow morning by the mood I'm in. If I'm smiling, grinning ear to ear, that means Canada won the gold medal. If I'm like, uh, then they probably lost. Uh, but I will be back again tomorrow. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing right now in AMC theaters everywhere. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. And I think starting next week, um, for those of you who like to listen to, to shows on iTunes, I think starting next week, we're going to start putting AMC Mailbag into our iTunes feed. I've been resisting that. I've, I've kind of liked just leaving our iTunes feed just for AMC Movie Talk, but I've been convinced. People have talked me into it. So I think next week, we're going to start putting uh, this into that as well, into our iTunes feed as well, so you can listen to this show on your way to work or while you're working out of the gym or whatever it is you're doing. So uh, that'll do it for me. Thank you so much for joining me for on this installment of AMC Mailbag. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. And until then, I'm John Campia for AMC Movie News. Bye-bye. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to AMC Movie News on YouTube. It's free and a great way to stay updated with all the latest movie news and check out our daily show, AMC Movie Talk. Also, don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter to stay in the loop for our special prizes, giveaways, and contests.